Arthur J. Harris, Billy Capshaw, welcome to the program. Thank you, Russ. Hi, Russ. Hi. Arthur J. Harris is a true crime author who has written for several newspaper publications. His stories have appeared on TV's Hard Copy, Inside Edition, Anderson 360, and A Current Affair. His books include Until Proven Innocent, Flowers for Mrs. Luskin, Speed Kills, and Jeffrey Dahmer's Dirty Secret, The Unsolved Murder of Adam Walsh, Books 1 and 2. He has investigated the murder of Adam Walsh for over 15 years. My other guest, Billy Capshaw, is a retired U.S. soldier. While stationed in Germany, Billy was assigned a room with Jeffrey Dahmer. Over the course of 13 months, Dahmer tortured and controlled Billy while keeping him captive in their room. He's here to tell us how he survived this experience and how for over 10 years he has worked with Arthur J. Harris investigating the murder of Adam Walsh and the unsolved crimes of Jeffrey Dahmer. Art, let's begin with the murder of Adam Walsh, the son of John Walsh. John Walsh, of course, being the well-known host of America's Most Wanted. On July 27, 1981, Six-year-old Adam Walsh went missing from the Sears department store at the Hollywood Mall in Hollywood, Florida. On August 10, 1981, Adam's severed head was found by two fishermen in Vero Beach. Although no one has ever been convicted of the crime, police closed the case in 2008, naming Otis Toole as the murderer. Toole died 12 years earlier in 1996 of liver failure. Art, from your research into the murder of Adam Walsh, what led you to initially believe Jeffrey Dahmer may have been the killer and not Otis Toole. I looked at this, I started looking at this case in 1996 when the police were forced by the courts to open the public records. It was a 15-year-old case at that point and it was very unusual for a, uh, an unsolved case to be, uh, to be opened you know, for everyone. It was a huge story here. And um, I looked at it for quite some time. And then about six years later, I'm in a used bookstore. And I pick up, I see that there are you know, interviews with Jeffrey Dahmer and uh, grab it. And I see something that was really struck my eye in the, in the interview that Dahmer was talking about in Milwaukee, picking up children at a shopping mall. He said it was a coincidence that he had picked up the younger brother of someone that he had already sexually assaulted and, in fact, was convicted and served some jail time for. And he wrote that he was the brother of the one that I'd photographed. I was just walking in the mall, ran into him, didn't know him from Adam. How many are the chances of that happening? Astronomical. So I look at this and I go, didn't know him from Adam? Since I knew that Dahmer was a person of interest in the file from the 1996 stuff that had been released. But the Hollywood police had pretty much dismissed him. They didn't find that he was here, even though that Dahmer had said he was here. They just weren't that interested. Uh, at that moment, I decided that I needed to go back into the file and read everything that about Jeffrey Dahmer in the file and find out everything that I possibly could about Dahmer's time in South Florida which happened to be during the same time that Adam Walsh was taken. He was here that, sum, that spring and summer of 1981, and as you said, July 27 of 81 is when Adam Walsh disappeared from the Hollywood Mall. I was very lucky in that I knew a police transcript of an interview, an hour interview that they had done with Dahmer in Milwaukee, in Wisconsin, in prison in 92 that I knew where he'd worked, because he um, gave the name of the store and pretty much where it was. It was in the north part of Miami Beach, about 20 minutes away from the, from the Hollywood Mall. And Dahmer, again, denied having anything to do with Adam Walsh, but he was certainly coincidental that he was here. Dahmer had severed heads. Uh, they were found in his, uh, in his apartment. You know, there were 11 of them. And the head that was found and said to be Adam was severed as well. So that same connection, as it turns out, had been made by an FBI agent from Madison, Wisconsin, who said, no, let's check him out for Adam Walsh. Remember, he denied Adam Walsh, but Florida is a death penalty state. Wisconsin was not, is not. Ohio, where he confessed to a murder that he didn't have to, was at the time of that murder not a death penalty state. So his lawyers had advised him and kept away the, Holly, the any Florida police from speaking to him. 
And somehow the Hollywood, Florida police were just pretty reluctant to investigate this. But I found the people who ran this, the sub shop where he worked for a couple of months, and I found four people who knew him there working at the sub shop. There was a blue van that was a delivery vehicle, that, that sub shop, and I, and I found eight people who remembered it. The first good lead that Hollywood police had when they were looking for the taker of Adam was they had a kid who had seen a blue van get away, no, a man throw a child that he said was Adam into the van and it got away, and the police were stopping blue vans all over the state for about a month. They asked for the public to call in and get the license plates, and they would investigate. And then, so, and then Dahmer is not only here, you know, 20 minutes away, but he had access to a, a blue van that was easily accessible, all eight people told me. And there were witnesses. There were initially, in 96, there were two witnesses who had come to the police and said, they were at the mall that day. They, you know, when Dahmer's story in 91 on in Milwaukee when it broke, they saw the papers and said, that's the guy I saw at Hollywood Mall one day. One of the witnesses said that he was outside. He saw that man, Jeffrey Dahmer, throw Adam Walsh into a blue van. Another man elsewhere in the, in the mall had said that you know, Dahmer had come up to him and like he was going to either you know, grab him or pick him up or, or you know, as in, you know, sexually pick him up and stared him in the eye. It was a very, very scary thing. When he rebuffed him, he finally at last Dahmer turned around, and then this man followed him from elsewhere in the mall into Sears and into the toy department in Sears, which is where Adam was last seen. So as it turns out, after the 2008 public records release, and they released more after they closed the case and said it was on his tool, there were seven police witnesses who found in there and spoke to and showed them pictures of Otis Tool and they said, no, that's not who we saw. And then I showed them pictures of Jeffrey Dahmer and they said, yes, that's who we saw. But the police weren't interested in that. Would you like to ask why? <laughs> Just tell me. Well, I don't know. I don't know. They had, they had in their mind that it was, they closed the case on Otis Tool. Otis Tool had confessed to the murder in 1983. Uh, numerous taped interviews transcribed in the case file, and there, and I have generous selections from those interviews in my first book, book one. It's clear that Tool knew nothing, no specifics at all about this case. As he recalled it the first time, the initial, the, for the initial interviews, he said, that um, Adam was wearing long pants, it was around the beginning of the year, and he thought he was wearing mittens. Now, I've been here in South Florida. Now, I know you're Canadian, so maybe you don't really understand this, but in 30 years, I've never seen anyone, including a child, wearing mittens at any time of the year, and especially not in the last week of July. So that wasn't right, Otis. They got that wrong. But I'll give you another reason why I think that it was wrong again, in a public record that I asked for that wasn't even in the Hollywood Police public records, there was a forensic anthropologist report. They, in 97, they, had, they did a tool mark analysis. They took the skull of the found head that they said was Adam, and they had some machetes, bayonets, that were in tool's possession, and they tried to match them the tools to the tool marks from the experts and stuff. So they, that was inconclusive. It was a nice try. So there was a couple page report in the Hollywood police file, and I know to ask for the full reports, that, which was not in the police file. So I got permission from Hollywood police, and they got for me the full report from the forensic anthropologist. Uh, let me ask Billy here. Can you put a scalpel in Jeff Dahmer's hands at oh, any oh, given moment? Yes. Can you do it? Yes, you can. Okay. Yes. And now, we know from reading Dahmer's father's book that they together, when Jeff was a kid, 8, 9, 10, whatever years old, that they dissected roadkill. Jeff, as 
Billy has told me, as we've been talking for 10 years, uh, Jeff knew anatomy extremely well. He was teaching anatomy to Billy. They were also in the medic unit, so they were, they were learning medical things. So I can put a scalpel in Jeff Dahmer's hands. Would you say that Otis Tool, a noted blockhead of somewhat less than high intelligence, would you say it would be likely, Russell, that he would be handling a scalpel? Not well. Probably not, okay? So in the forensic anthropology report, there is a line in there that the Hollywood police didn't see because they didn't get the report that they had ordered, and it says in there that one of the cuts looked like it was made by a scalpel. Those two things, you no know, tool handling a scalpel, not likely. Dahmer handling a scalpel, absolutely. That was consistent with him. Everything that Tool told to the Hollywood police, he was told by the police detectives or shown from the file. And I'm not criticizing them for that. Okay, it sounds really bad, but I'm not. It's, it's actually an investigative technique. Tool, they were trying to prod him. You know, if you told him a little bit and a little bit and a little bit more, could he volunteer something that would absolutely prove that he knew something that they could prove? And they kept giving him and giving him and asking him multiple choice. He never came up with the right answers. No, the next day when they showed him out to the took him out to the sites, and then he 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 spotted the mile markers, the pictures of which that he was shown, and then oh, I remember. No, this this is where I did it over a mile marker 131. The multiple choices were things like, Otis, when you left Hollywood Mall, did you take the, uh, the interstate, did you take the turnpike, or did you take A1A, which is the local road? And Tool answered things like, uh, I'd say it was A1A, which is the local road. So like, you know, 400 miles back to Jacksonville on the local road, or you take the interstate or the turnpike. Now, that's, those were his first answers. They were ridiculous. Billy, let's uh, bring into the program here. You've been helping. Arthur J. Harris, Art Harris, investigate the uh, murder of Adam Walsh for over 10 years. I think it's safe to say that you're an expert on uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. You certainly knew him well enough. Describe Jeffrey Dahmer. You know, he was a, a good-looking guy. You know, he's an uh, all-American type guy, you know. He's just you know, light-handed, stuff like that when I met him. Just a really nice guy. Real nice mannerisms when he shook your hand, you know, it kind of bend over. I noticed that, you know, and stuff like that. You know, as, as later on, I watched him so close after about a month that when he was out in, you know, in the hall or something, you know, at in the barracks, that he would talk to people in a different way than he was talking to me, you know. And sometimes he was nice to to me, but you know, not all. Of course, not all of them, but. Uh, a very nice guy. You would never think in a million years that this was this kind of guy. For me, that was uh, at first, you know, when I first met him, that was a, a good reason to be his, uh, his roommate. Just nice guy. I thought, you know, yeah, I'll be his roommate. Yeah, no problem. We kind of got through together that way, you know. There was uh, only, I think, uh, room for, uh, well, there, there was other people in the other rooms. It was room 103, I think. You know, we were just there. Super nice guy at first, but that all changed. How old were you at the time? I was 17 years old. And how old was Jeffrey? He was probably, I don't know, about 19 then, I think. 18, 19. But he's, I want to say something, Russell. He was very mature for that age. You know, very mature. If you look at the pictures of him at 19 years old, and then you look at the pictures of me and other soldiers at 17, or 19, or whatever, you'll see that. You know, very well-mannered, very uh, uh, well-spoken, all that stuff. So. Art was saying just earlier that he was teaching you medical information from books, teaching you the human anatomy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was uh, one of his, uh, I guess, uh, his hobbies. He would give me uh, parts of uh, the body to memorize and you know, he had the books to do it with. He had Gray's Anatomy, and he had a book of anatomy by the name of Nesbitt. It's not, I don't know where that came from. Anyway, they were, uh, the photos were color, 
the guy that did the book was a anatomist, and they were a very good books, you know. And I'd have to memorize this stuff and repeat it to him, you know, when he when he asked me. I'd have to. Uh, well, he tested me on it, and I had to get it right. I had to get it right, Russell. And when did things start? I'd say I'd say about the second day. I want to say the second day. Yeah, this was an immediate thing. Yep, immediate. No powwow, no nothing. It was he turned on, and it was hard to turn off. You know, it was horrible. You know, don't want to go back there, but I will. You know, and talk about it now after all this time. But you know, this guy is not what you not what you would think he would be at all so it makes you wonder what people are thinking you know what i mean you never know art do you think the public the persona that jeffrey dahmer has right now in the media do you think that's accurate through his interviews the various documentaries well like billy says there's a jekyll and hyde to him and that behind the closed doors then he turns into mr hyde so the interviews he did on television with stone phillips and nancy glass were accurate as Dr. Jekyll. That Would you say so, Jeff, uh, Bill? Yeah, I would say so. Nancy Glass, if you look at that YouTube video, you'll see him. You can see him change. And he was almost ready to lunge at her. Almost. You got to catch it, though. If you don't know Jeff, you won't know when. But I had it almost down to a science at the time. When I was young, you know, I almost knew when it was coming, but he changed. He changed regularly. He always, you never knew. You never knew. It was so fast, a millisecond, okay, a millisecond. There's a sympathy out there for Dahmer, though. Um, he's not hated like Ted Bundy or John Wayne Gacy. People try to understand him. They don't hate him. They don't hate him, okay. Well... Like I said, he's a very nice guy, superficially. Russell, would you want to go in a room by yourself with him and spend the night? I don't think so. No. No. Not not if someone didn't know you were there. You surely wouldn't. Now, maybe if there were cops around, you might want to do it, you know? He knew what he was doing. I don't know why people sympathize with him. I don't get it. Of course, I'm you know, was one of the victims. But the thing is, is, you know, that I don't get that. I do not get that. They don't understand Jeff Dahmer, okay? He's a classic psychopathic, violent psychopath that we don't want in our, uh, in our lives, I'll tell you. When you're in the room with somebody who's terrifying you and who's in it, I get goosebumps now even, and who's attacking you, who's doing bad things to you, breaking your bones, beating you with a pipe, and all that kind of stuff, you kind of have to watch this guy. So what I did was, I didn't do it consciously, I don't think, but what I did was I watched his movements, I watched everything he did, his mouth, I watched his eyes, I watched his chest, his legs, his feet, his arms, his hands, everything. So that is that is stuck in my head. It will never go away. You can see. I can see it. I don't know if everybody else can, but they better, you know, try to try to try to notice that. And there's one interview with uh, Nancy Glass that they, you can see that. But uh, he was definitely not a nice person. I just want to stress that. He was a heavy drinker. Yeah, he liked to drink. He drank all the time. But I tell you about his drinking. He would drink, but I would go over to his bunk, okay? I was like, get close to him or something like that. This dude would come alive. You know, it was like he knew. He, he had radar or something, you know? I mean, he would come alive and the fight was on, you know? It was on. He, he might have been a, a bad drinker. He might... I don't know, maybe he didn't remember some of the things. I don't know. But to say that the drinking was uh, part of the, the problem with him would, would be, you know, that that's fair to say. But I don't think that was why. I think Jeff was who he was, you know. 
He was who he was. So the drinking got, got him to the second to Mr. Hyde, just like in the Jekyll and Hyde story. There was some chemical that changed this person into the second personality. Yeah, I suppose that's what I'm trying to get at. Is uh... are you tr- are you trying to say? Um, I think Russell. I think I, I think I'm following you now. Are you trying to say that maybe that the drinking made him that way? Well, just as Art is uh, implying there, that Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, that there was a catalyst that would change him. It may have helped out. It may have been a catalyst sometimes. Yeah, but sometimes I think maybe that he was completely sober. You can't really uh, put a finger on that. You know, that's, that's hard to do. Well, I think that Jeff had said in, in some interview someplace that it was the drinking that had caused him to do it. But you're saying that there were times when he wasn't drinking that he would assault you. And then again, he said he drank all the time. Right. I, I'm, I'm saying that there were occasions that he was sober. You know, maybe a hangover or something like that. Yeah. I'm saying that, I guess, what I'm trying to say is uh, that's a hard question. Very hard question. You know, he had a job, I mean, at the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory, you know. I mean, he got to work every day. I mean, he was sober during work most of the time, probably. You know? And he's okay. working at, at the sub shop here in Miami Beach, North Miami Beach. However, he was the manager had told me that he had sent him away on a couple of occasions because he came in drunk and disheveled and said, come back tomorrow, and he, and he would. And then he just, you know, disappeared from the manager's site. And then finally, he, he fired him entirely because of that. Jeff Dahmer is who Jeff Dahmer was. And, you know, if you want to say, you know, if people want to sympathize about the drinking, you know, or whatever, you know, they can, you know. But I don't think it's completely true. I think that that did, if he, if he was uh, drinking, he was more, the attacks were worse, I think, and more brutal. Yeah. Well, what were some of the methods of torture that Jeffrey Dahmer used against you? Okay, his wall locker contained, the reason I know this, Russell, is because he did leave sometimes. The door locked from inside and outside. I have pictures of it. He would lock the door, had no key, and I would go into his wall locker. There's a little nipple on the end of the top. I pried it back and I looked inside. I would steal his money, thinking that would not make him drink, and that contradicts what I just said. But, you know, he was much worse drunk. And I would steal his money, and I'd put it into the bunk, you know, where the bunk attaches to the other bunk. There was some bunks in his bunk and my bunk. I would stick the money down in there. A lot of money, man. I stole a lot of money. But it also contained a knife. It contained Ativan and uh, a drug called ketamine, and syringes, all the stuff that we were issued as medics. So is ketamine the drug that they weren't able to disclose during the trial? I would bet money on it. Yeah, I, w- I would say that would be one of the drugs. Bill, he used that on you, didn't he? Yes, he did. Yeah, so ketamine, Ativan. How would he slip that in? How would he get you to take it? I guess through a drink, maybe. I've got some scars on my... Um, where injections were made in my arm, you know, and stuff like that. So, you know, he he did have enough, and this contradicts what I said a while ago, you know, as well, but he did make the torture a little bit easier when that drug was used, yeah. I wouldn't want to be hit like that if I could get out of it, you know, with a drug and wake up the next day. He would beat you? He would not cut you? Well, I got some stab marks. I mean, those are cuts. He had also, I forgot to tell you about this, he had a ice pick looking thing it's a i think what it was used for i've looked them up it's a tool used for sticking into a tire or something like that that was one of the weapons that he had as well and i got a some of those kind of marks too quite a few of them i was thinking about why would you use an ice pick what would be the best reason to use an ice pick and i i thought about it and thought about less bleeding punchers don't bleed like cuts they don't that's the only thing I can I can think of why he did that. But, uh, you know, he, he had a massive amounts of blood on him many, many times when he returned from different places. So, I mean, I've actually seen this guy pull his clothes off and have to peel his T-shirt off and his clothing. It was dried onto his skin. He'd been out for a while. 
couple of days, three days. When he came back, he went to Oktoberfest uh, in Munich. And when he came back from that, he was just a bloody mess. So let's build the case for a different Jeffrey Dahmer, one that was probably killing throughout his adult life. Because the official story right now is that there was about an eight-year period of dormancy, I believe, where he hadn't killed anyone. However, there were several unsolved murders around the barracks. From my understanding, there was probably about, let's see, five, six, seven, about eight, I think, that I know. Eight, you know, I think there's more, isn't there? Well, there's there. I think he's asking you around the barracks, which you know more than I do. I know that there was maybe a dozen murders with maybe within fifty mile, fifty mile, fifty kilometer radius of Baumholder, Germany, which is where the base was. While he was there, that didn't happen before and didn't happen afterwards. And Germany was in 1981 was not like Miami in 1981 because that was just like a no, bad week in Miami. Or maybe not even a bad week, but in Germany, it's two to three hundred murders a year, and then you had uh, not very well publicized what may have been a series of murders. It may not have been a series, but it may well have been a series. And there were women in there. There were mostly women. They weren't exclusively. When Bill talks about blood on this man's shirt, and then on the knives, and there was there's more than one knife. Knife, he said. There was blood and there was mucus on, on the knives, and that, Bill, you told me that you throw those knives out the window and then he'd replace them. That's and then right. it would happen again. Every time. Yes. We think that there was, we, you know, certainly we don't believe his, Jeffrey Dahmer was, was a liar while he was at large, an extremely good manipulator. Would you, would you agree with that, Bill? Oh, oh, yes, very much. And then somehow... We wanted to believe, we collectively wanted to believe that when he was caught and in police custody and was being tried for the murders that he admitted to, that he suddenly turned into a truth teller. And that, to me, is a big disconnect, except that I understand that certainly for people in Milwaukee, they would have wanted to think that, okay, we got him, he's not at large anymore, and whatever he admitted to, that was it and nowhere else, and that's the end of that, and that's sort of what the trial was about. Now, according to a wonderful report in, by a reporter from Psychology Today who had sat in on the, same, on the whole trial, this was a washing for the city of Milwaukee and area, and they were plenty up in arms about that. They were nuts about Jeffrey Dahmer, and that was, and like, to have whatever other numbers of Jeffrey Dahmer murders that could have been all over the country. Now, for instance, we know that Jeffrey Dahmer, in at least 1981, after he's thrown out of the Army, now leaves Miami in roughly September of 81, that he drives his car or his family's car to Hot Springs, Arkansas, which is where Billy is, and he wanted to see Billy. And there he is in a car, and I know from talking to Billy's sister, who intercepted Dahmer once or twice, trying, he really wanted to see Billy, and looked down into his car and described it and saw axes and hammers and saws in the back seat of that car. This guy drove from what must have been Ohio to Arkansas and could have driven anywhere else. Now, for most of that time, it didn't seem like he had a car, but he had a car then. Now, you have murders that are potentially anywhere else, and he was not going to give them up. Yet yeah, why? What reason would he have had to lie at that point? He was going to serve the maximum anyhow. Well, he's, you know, he's a practice manipulator. I mean, he's a practice liar. I mean, what reason would he, why would he start telling the truth to the entirety? He says, I have learned in my writings of true crime that my definition of a liar is someone who tells 99 true things, including things you weren't expecting, in order to cover one lie, one thing that he does not want you to know. And there are a number of things that Jeff Dahmer didn't want you to know, including that about Adam Walsh. That happened in a death penalty state, and Jeff Dahmer could be on the record in saying, no, I really want the death penalty. Okay, sure. Okay, let's believe Jeff Dahmer when he says that. Now, 
Jeff Dahmer did not admit to Adam Walsh for that reason, plus it was the murder of a child. It was the murder of a famous child, famous in the aftermath of his taking. A child serving time in prison for the murder of a child was, you know, for the rest of your life, was not really a good thing for anybody, including Jeff Dahmer. It's just another reason. And, and plus, I think, would you agree, Bill, that he just liked misleading people, like getting away with it. Like, it was a powerful thing to be able to mislead people. Would you, would you yeah. agree with that? Yes, I would. And he liked to control people. He liked to control the barracks. I mean, the people that were supposed to be his superiors. He could, could, he could even control them, being nice. He manipulated the uh, people around the barracks, even. I mean, yeah, well, a lot of people are asking, because I'm getting lots of emails on this, why you stayed so long in this relationship with Jeffrey Dahmer. I wasn't in a relationship, per se, but where was I going to go? He was a prisoner. That that's answers that. Uh, how was I going to get out of there? I jumped out the window, broke a hip, broke bones. They would bring me back, put me right back in there. I mean, it was horrible. I could not get out of there. You know, I could not get out of there. Would Jeffrey take care of you when you had broken bones? And oh yeah, he fed me. He took helped me to the restroom, and the shower, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, if if you want to say he's a nice guy for that, okay, well, whatever. So he could be both nurturing and sadistic. Yeah, and b bizarre guy. You know, after I went through all this therapy, we had to go back in time, develop. And I just want to say, you know, when you're 17 years old and you come from a family of five girls and two boys, I was the seventh of eight kids, you know, it's kind of hard when you're 17 years old and you go in the military, you get through basic training, you get through your AIT or, or individual training, you go to your permanent party, you meet a guy like Jeff Dahmer, you get put in the room with him at 17 years old, you don't even know who you are at that time. So we had to go back, find out exactly who Billy was. You know, it's it's kind of like you re, you you have to you have to find out who your well, I had to find out what my personality was even. I didn't even really have a personality. I couldn't cry. I had to learn how to cry again. I had to learn how to smile. I had this terrible look on my face. Like you know, it was it, my mom always said, "Please try to smile." You know, you know, I just didn't I didn't know who I was at all. I didn't know. I just knew that, that I was alive. I mean, I didn't know how to talk to people. I just was a mess. So uh, you just really have to, when you, when you talk about, you know, this, this don't happen. I couldn't talk to you, Russell, today if I hadn't had Dr. Gene Waterman. He took me under his wing. I went to his house for therapy when he retired. We kept it going. We worked hard at it. Okay? Hard. This is hard work. This is not something that happens overnight. And Arthur J. Harris, I just want to add that he is the best man I've ever met. He stuck with me 10 years now, even though I was a hell of a mess when he met me. He kind of helped me through the, the last 10 years. With doing this stuff, it helped me do something good and helped me develop skills that I, I uh that I didn't have before helped me talk to people. He he's a very good man. I just want to add that. Billy helped yeah. me incredibly, you know, to just vetting all these witnesses, and then and so, in so many ways and so much information about Jeff. What a source on, on Jeff Dahmer that that he is. He's absolutely the best. That you know there is nobody who knows Jeff Dahmer, unfortunately, as well as Bill. But I think one of the questions Russell or may want to know, or the emailers want to know, is why couldn't he get out of that room? Why? No. Why? It's the army. I mean, how could how could something like this happen in the army? Well, why did twenty six thousand rapes happen last year in the army or the military? I, you know, I don't know. I can't answer that. You know, it's probably because nobody listens. I've got a saying. You know, if you don't listen, you don't hear it. You don't hear anything. You know, and if you listen to people. You're going to hear something. I was told to shut up, called a, uh, I want to keep it clean, called names and things like that. You know, I tried my rear end off to get this took care of. It was not taken care of, no matter how many injuries there were, no many, no matter whatever happened, it just wasn't there. I don't even think we had a commanding officer, okay? 
You know, it's sort of like the, what's going on this week with the Miami Dolphins, my home football team, and the bullying between these big 300-pound defensive linemen where one of the offensive linemen who finally, after a year and a half of hazing and bullying and physical abuse, apparently, just gave up. And it's like, how could on a NFL team that everybody knew what was happening to some extent, now how could that continue and not be reported? And the answer is sort of that there are little universes that go on, and they're very private. You know, hazing, you know, they, that happens in college teams, maybe every college team, high school, it happens all over, and it doesn't get reported, and nobody, you know, everyone turns either a blind eye or they laugh at you, and then you're just kind of stuck there. And the military, was there a chief military officer that Billy could have gone to to say, no, this man is, is abusing me, he's, he's torturing me, he's raping me? No, there wasn't anybody. And he basically got laughed at as being soft. And yet the person who was controlling him was none other than Jeffrey Dahmer. In 1991, when Dahmer was arrested, did you speak to the police? Uh, yes, I, I spoke with the German Polizei, I guess, you know, all the, all the different initials, yeah. They told me, congratulations, <laughs> you know, you've made it. So essentially, you were never able to report this for a decade. That's right, that's right. But who, the military who, who, knew what had happened. There's reports, and Billy's got disability, and there's stuff in his medical records that he's gotten, and the military would seem to know enough of what happened, at least afterwards, and when I say the military, that's the institution. No, the individuals in his barracks who didn't do anything and would seem to be feeling very guilty about it. It's, the reports are sound. It just continued. And then finally, they threw Dahmer out of the Army eight, nine months early. And then they sent him to the States and they gave him a plane ticket. No, one way, go anywhere you want. He could have gone home to Ohio. Guess where he went? Miami, Florida. And that's where he spent the spring and summer of 1981. And then he called his father. I need to come home. Actually, no. What happened was the guy who hired him at the sub shop, he was a nice guy, and he was interested in Jeff, and somehow we got out of him that he'd been in the military. He'd hired him. He was going through his trash. You look like you're hungry. You know, come in. Don't eat out of there. You know, come out. I'll give you lunch. And then he hired him, and they, he's, he said, no, does your, does your dad know that you're here? He says, no, probably something like, nah, my dad, you know, I'm, I'm not really close to my dad. And that manager, a, a mature man, said, all right, give me the number. I'm going to call him. And that's, where his, that's how his dad knew that he was working for Sunshine Subs in North Miami Beach or Sunny Isles you know, in Dade County, Florida. Later, that's, you know, Jeff called and said, I'm out of money, you know, I got, you know, he had been fired from his job, he'd been drinking, and then they just, and then they said, all right, you know, when Jeff had wanted money, and instead they, they arranged a plane ticket home for him. Tell me about the locked refrigerator. Okay, there was a, a small dorm-sized refrigerator in the room that was locked, and he would go to that refrigerator occasionally, put bags, you know, these brown paper bags, he would put things in there, and I, what is that, you know, uh, he told me one time it was liver pate. You know, I mean, that's the one I remember. And lunch meat and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I really never got to see in it. Art, um, are you able to tell the audience what the police found inside his fridge in Milwaukee? They, they opened the fridge, and there's a, um, an effing head in the refrigerator. The cop screamed out. And then they found more in the freezer, and then he had a separate another freezer and there were more there and more heads corpses that were throughout the apartment and it was um, a, a charnel house it was it was pretty nasty they were pretty traumatic just for the cops to go in there very traumatic shall i say billy you also have to remember he was hungry all the time because jeff didn't feed him didn't let him eat and didn't let him communicate with home didn't he didn't get mail he didn't get paid so billy was always searching for food so that's so he wanted to get it was lunch meat in the refrigerator, but it's locked. Billy ate cookies from his grandmother, you know, Jeff's grandmother, who, who had sent them cookies. That was nice. I think I lost Russell probably about 50, 60 pounds while I was in there. You know, Over a year. Uh, yeah. 
it was horrible. I try to put it in perspective, though. I try to put it in perspective, and you got to put it in perspective. You got to remember, I was 17 years old. You got to remember that, you know, I didn't know what to do. All I knew was uh, I didn't want to die. I didn't want to die. I wanted to do something to him so bad, but I wanted to go home so bad, too. My mother and my sisters, uh, and Art's got the video, they called Germany every day looking for me. Every day, Russell. Their bill was like a thousand dollars. Okay, their phone bill in, in in eighty and eighty one. I mean, they looked for me. They was told I was a wall. They was told that I was missing or whatever. My mother, you know, she thought maybe he got sent out on something and was killed or whatever, and they hadn't found him yet or whatever. Because of, of all my relatives that have been in wars, but they didn't know what was going on. It was after Vietnam. It was a messy military, messy, very messy. And I hardly remember even coming home. I was escorted home by some sergeant, I think, you know, or something like that. That's how bad sick I was. They had to pin my clothing on me. You know, it was a mess. It was horrible to bring your kid home like that. I mean, my poor mother. Did you ever think of attacking Jeff? Yeah, I thought about it. I was going to kill him at once, Russell. I thought about it and thought about it, but what's better? Go home, don't go to jail. I had enough sense to know that. I should have, by all means, done something to him. It, it was justified, but where would I be now? Could you have killed him? Would there have been an opportunity? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, there would have been a lot of opportunities. Do you have guilt for not killing him? Yeah, I have survivor's guilt. Look what happened. He goes to Florida. He kills, you know, a, a, a kid. I mean, he goes to uh, to Milwaukee, kills 17 people. He kills people, I believe, in Germany. I mean, there's not any evidence that he actually killed these people. I want to stick to the facts that we can prove. But that seven-year hiatus that everybody's talking about he didn't kill, I don't believe that at all. That's a bunch of garbage, and it needs people need to quit sympathizing with people like him. But I think it's fair to say that there wasn't any evidence for many of the 17 murders already attributed to him. Many of the bodies he had already disintegrated in hydrochloric acid. Right. There were three or four of those that he didn't have to admit to, but they were piling on. There, was, there were no death penalties that were going to be applied for there. Now, once he had 11, it really didn't matter. I think he figured that the 78 murder when he was still in high school in Ohio was something that they were going, that the police were going to, or maybe they even told him, like, we're going to try and find out everywhere that you've ever been, and then we're going to look for unsolved murders for there. And I think that he just volunteered it and said, all right, I'll look like a good guy. You know, I'm volunteering Stephen Hicks in June of 1978, and I murdered him. And here I can show you where the body parts or, you know, are. They did it, and they found teeth, and they found pieces of the skull that he'd hacked. And then, wow, he's really a truth teller. Okay? Those are among the 99 truths that he told to cover up the remaining things that he did not want to tell about. And for Billy, I mean, I mean, where is there a discussion of, uh, about Billy Capshaw from Jeff Dahmer? Where is there a discussion about the man who he, there's a police report in Dade County, it's dated 20 days before Adam Walsh, it's July 7 of, of 1981. Jeff Dahmer reports a dead body in the alley behind the sub shop where he worked. The report, which Hollywood police never got, I got it myself. It wasn't easy to find. You had to know that it was there. Now, according to Mr. Jeffrey Dahmer, it says, so Jeff Dahmer is finding dead bodies behind the sub shop. Is that suspicious? Well, he didn't say anything about that to anybody. But if he's coming clean about everything, now, might that have been something that he might have added? No, even if he really did find the body, okay? Like, well, I also happen to have found a, a, a dead body, you know, of a homeless man behind the, the, behind the sub shop. But I didn't have anything to do with that. But he didn't even say that. This man is not a reliable person. He's an interesting person to listen to. But if you are taken in by him and you think that he just, we, we'd like to think that he told everything. No, and that's the official word. And that is just not true. Well, I think one of his biggest advocates has been Lionel Dahmer, his father who himself, Lionel, called into America's Most Wanted, believing that Jeffrey Dahmer had, in fact, killed Adam Walsh. 
Lionel Dahmer did make that connection, and so did the FBI agent from Madison, Wisconsin, Eagle Purcell. You would think that that would have been a serious investigation, but Hollywood police wasn't interested. And again, Lionel only knew that because the sub shop owner had called him to say, this is where your son is. He's in Miami. I didn't know that. Or possibly it was that by then that his trunk and stuff had gotten to his Ohio home from Germany. And what's this all about? Where is Jeff? We don't know. One of the witnesses that saw Jeff Dahmer in the Hollywood Mall, or claims to, mentioned his eyes. Uh, Billy, can you studied the man. What were his eyes like? Beautiful eyes. They really were. I mean, until he got into the, the hide phase, and, and they changed. They would go right through you. you. They were blank. You know, I mean, it, it's hard to describe. When you think about it, when Jeff, you know, when he attacks... Uh, happened to be there a few times, unfortunately, but he's attacking. He says nothing. He says no words whatsoever. He don't even make grunts, anything. But his head and his eyes and his body language, his face makes movements. And all of a sudden, his eyes, they change. And they just like, they're like piercing. They go right through you. You know you got a problem right then. I mean, Basically. right that second. He's depersonalizing you. He's objectifying you. And I've never met anybody no, remotely like that. I dare say, Russell, that you haven't either. And that's something that you would say, I need to be away from this person, unless, of course, you're trapped by him. And it wasn't just one witness. Basically, everybody who came into close contact with him was traumatized by that look. It was a very scary thing. They've never forgotten it. Witness after witness. Even the sub shop owner had said the same thing to me when he told him off and then he gave him a look and says, says, you give me that look one more time and you're in big trouble. Now, there are countless people and not just you know, in Florida, but that was a common thing. Billy was great in analyzing what, and talking to these witnesses and sharing the experience. And when they told him, volunteered that stuff, especially about the eyes, then Billy comes back and says, yep, that's Jeff. That, no, that's nobody else. That is very unusual. Just one of these things that you would have to have met Jeff Dahmer to have known. Yes, very much so. I tell you, if you ever met Jeff, you would never forget him if he was in that, in that hide thing. Now, if he's walking in the mall on a normal day, maybe... You know, you wouldn't think that. But when he's in the mall, when he's abducting a kid, you got to, uh, you got to think of, you know, I'm stuck for words, you know, right now. But, you know, it's, it's so traumatizing when he goes in that phase. You know, there's actually a lady, Linda Sue Swisher, who's in a PTSD home, you know, from that. She was traumatized just by the way he was looking at her. You know, she, she's very sick from it. She so. was a nurse and bomb holder, and she taught him some things, and she's got survivor's guilt about teaching him you know, things like how to use a scalpel, even though he already knew. And I was going to add that I've spoken to other people who were chased, other children who were chased by Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, one of whom was in another Sears in Palm Beach County, which is maybe 40, 50 miles north of here north of Hollywood, and you know, when he saw Jeff Dahmer's picture for the first time on the news, he said, that's the man, that's, that's who chased me. There's also, from that same episode, there were, there were witnesses who had seen uh, the man chasing a child, and they did a police artist drawing of it. In my book, it looks just like Jeffrey Dahmer, circa 1981. Just like him. Striking. That man was on the prowl here. Now, there, I have a number of incidences where it sounds like he was chasing others. He's been identified by others. That, no, Adam, taking Adam Walsh was not isolated. No, this is just what he did. You know, he was successful with, with Adam Walsh. Do you think it's possible that there, is a, that there was a network of these serial killers that perhaps Tool, Lucas, Dahmer knew each other? There was even an instance where Tool and Ted Bundy shared a prison cell in Florida. 
that's weird, but obviously if they're in prison, they're not out on the loose doing anything together. In fact, Bundy is in prison by 78, and we're talking 81 for now. So I was, for the longest time, I considered Spool to be just a serial confessor as well as Lucas. And I didn't give them any credibility on, on anything that they had confessed to, except for the arson murder up in Jacksonville, which is why he was in Florida State Prison and eventually died there. But I came to realize that I might be wrong on that. I was able, on everything that I have, I have documentation. I have police and medical examiner, public records, large sources of, I have interviews that I've done, I've got previously published materials on whether I have a sense that Tool, Henry Lee Lucas, and Dahmer, I know that they were in the same very small general area, Sunny Isles, Florida, Sunny Isles Beach, in the end of May of 1981. I know because Tool and Lucas committed a murder in that Lucas gave a very good detailed confession to, and I saw the videotape, and I know the homicide detective, and I trust that. They were there together in 163rd Street in North Miami Beach, and Dahmer was working at 170th Street in North Miami Beach at the same time, and he was probably sleeping on the beach, which was only a block or so away, in, in, in where Dahmer was, it was across the street. And there's some other reasons to think, now it's not conclusive, it's definitely speculative, that um, Lucas knew, may not have known Dahmer by name, or may only have known him by Jeff, who knows, but Tool seems to have made the connection to Jeff Dahmer that spring or summer of 81 in southern Florida. Now, Lucas and Tool as well had talked about the Hand of Death cult, and for the longest time I thought that was a huge bunch of hooey. There's zero documentation, and it just sounded like you know, real horror film stuff. I you know, changed my mind, not with documentation that this stuff existed and was real, but it's in my mind that it's conceivable. It isn't just a Florida thing that Tool and Lucas, who were both separately talking about it from their prison cells, and I just don't know what to think. I mean, you know, this gets into the conspiratorial stuff and... You know, all this stuff that we're listening to, that you're listening to right now, may sound conspiratorial, the, all, my Adam Walsh, it may sound, but let me tell you, I'm a journalist, and my stuff, what I've written, what I'm telling you about, is documented. You know, when I speculate with, on very limited ways, like I just did now, I'll tell you it's speculation. You no, know, since 96, and really the past 10 years, you know, examining the Jeffrey Dahmer connection getting all the public records that were available. And I know this case, and I know the public records, and I've got more public records than the investigators have looked at. And this stuff is real. And to find somebody like Billy, who was never asked you no know, by anybody except for German poets, I would you know. You know when, when Jeff denied killing the girls, you no, know, anybody in Germany, they went, okay, well, you know, what are we going to do if he was going to admit to it? That would be great, but since he's not admitting to it, that's pretty much the end of it. And then they went and saw Billy. I think now it, your, the answer to your question is it's possible. Billy, did you ever see Dahmer meeting with anyone, privately meeting with anyone? or? Well, there were some guys with suits that came to the room, but I don't really know who they are. I'm thinking they were probably, Ger I mean, not German, but uh, American CID. Now, there's some, I was told by uh, a guy that who's deceased now, I won't mention his name. He said that they were investigating Jeff for a, a murder of a man named Hans. The military knew that there was a problem even when I got there. No one wanted to room with Jeff, and I don't know what to think about it. I mean, I, I really was afraid to say anything. I mean, they talked to him. I went outside you know, the room and stuff like that, and then they left. I mean, that was pretty much it. They had suits on. I don't know what they were talking about, but I'm pretty convinced that it was probably about the murder of Hans. He was last seen with Jeff. He left the barracks with Jeff right before I got there, and he was found mutilated, you know, probably 
uh, 20 kilometers from uh, from the barracks. That's that's what I know about uh, about that. Uh, other than seeing a couple of other people, I never really got to see many people. You know that that were supposed. I didn't even know how many people were in our our, our squad or company or anything like that. Billy is basically the guy who knows from the inside that room. Billy was in Germany for a year and a half. He never got to see it. He knows nothing about Germany except that the weather's cold. And he only knows that from opening the window. Yeah, jumping out the window. <laughs> but I, w I want to tell you, Russell, I'm okay. I'm solid. I'm good. I did my deed. I went to therapy. I, I found a good doctor. Art Harris found me. You know, and that helped me then, I think, to talk to Art and uh, to the witnesses and things like that. I'm solid. You know, it is scary. You get goosebumps and stuff like that, but you got to be able to put this behind you, you know. And people that have things like this happen to them, they need to be treated immediately. I mean, right that second. You know, they don't need to wait or anything like that. I, it took five, six years for me to start to start being treated. I had some stuff, I think, in Germany, some uh, different surgeries, I think, patching me up to send me home, you know, at the end of the... I'm not sure. I yeah. want to add that I was have been, always been cognizant that I didn't want to re-traumatize by talking and introducing him to witnesses and anything that was obviously going to bring back Jeff Dahmer. So I asked him over and over, are you okay with this? And he always said that he was. And I still think that on one interview that I had him do, he did re-traumatize himself. But what I did for Bill was I exposed him, again, from outside of that box, that room that he was in. I showed him other people who had met Jeff Dahmer, other people who had been traumatized by him. I brought him into a larger world, and then he saw that he wasn't the only one, to, rather to his surprise, because that's sort of a, a natural thing, that this is totally unique. Well, it's pretty damn unusual, but, it's, but it wasn't unique to him, and he was able to spread out himself and say, oh, okay, other people have come in contact with him and survived him, although a lot didn't survive him. During the vetting process for this program, uh, it came to light that um, Kip Capshaw, who is Billy's son, is currently serving a life sentence. I'll read this from the Associated Press clipping. The body of 29-year-old Melinda K. Jenkins was found April 8, 2007, and 41-year-old Janice Olissa Bills was found dead June 17. DNA evidence linked Capshaw to the killings. Investigators say Capshaw likely picked up his victims while they were hitchhiking. He then raped, beat, and strangled them, leaving them in the woods. Billy, I'd like you to talk about that, please. You know, I don't really think that's true. Not all of it's true. But uh, Kip did tell me, you know, I, I spoke with him last night on the phone. You know, he still says the same things, and I think it's been six years now, that he was with a guy, and they were doing drugs, and uh, he had sex with this one girl. The other guy that he was with strangled the girl, had a gun. That's all he'll say about it. You know, he said he did not kill the girl or the girls. You know, and the other, the Bills girl, uh, she's like 41 years old, and she had DNA, I think. Uh, they have not let me see the paperwork, the file. I think there's a problem with the case, got to be a problem with the case. I've only had one hour to look at 5,000 pages, okay? I don't know why. I can't buy it. I can't do anything. They won't talk to me about it. They get very mad even when I come to the uh, prosecutor's office or the uh, defender's office or whatever. They get angry. They won't, they won't give me any of the files. I thought closed cases, you know, you could make these records requests and get those files. But, you know, they're having a hard time upping them. I mean, there's some problems with it. Kip said he did not kill these people. And, you know, I believe him. You know, he's my son. I've never seen anything out of him that would uh, ever... Dayla, she, she uh, that's his half-sister, wrote something on the Internet suggesting that maybe some transfer that Dahmer stuff got into Kip or something. That's that's garbage. Kip had a good life. You know, when he was 16 years old, I bought him a new car, brand new off the showroom, you know. wasn't a used car. 
and then he wrecked it. I bought him a truck. He wrecked it. Kip didn't even have a car at the time. He didn't have a bicycle. He didn't have anything. I don't know how he was getting around other than this other guy. You know, I would make uh, Kip stay home and everything. I wouldn't let him. He was around the wrong crowd, I think. And he actually got, uh, I think, inside of the interrogation room or whatever they want to call it. They want to call it an interview room uh, here. Uh, but I think that they uh, coerced a confession out of him. That's what I think. That's my opinion, and I'm sticking to it. You know, I just don't see it. I don't see it at all. Do you think your known associations with Dahmer? I think so. Worked against you on that? Yeah. Yes, I do. And it's got to stop. My damn life has been hell. You know, Russell, it's been hell. You know, people don't get it. I mean, they need to start getting it, okay? I'm the guy you come to if you want to know something about Jeff, okay? I'm not the guy you kick down. And it seems like people want to kick me, kick me, kick me, kick me. I keep maintaining, though, I'm not giving up. You know, that's bullshit to give up. You know what I mean? It really is. You don't give up. Not when you come this far. You don't. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up on my son's case at all. That's why I won't go into the rest of it. But, you know, I'm not giving up on any of it. you got to know. you got to put things in perspective where people are at. You know, not everything's, you know, people want to believe what they read, and that's garbage. You know, people want to believe that stuff. You know, on, when someone is uh, arrested or he wasn't even convicted, it never went to trial. He plea bargained, okay, against my wishes. I wish he would have went to trial. Now, when you got a, a public defender, I sold my house. I sold everything I had to get money to get the attorney. I could not come up with the amount of money that they wanted. And it was a tremendous amount of money. I couldn't do it. Okay, the one uh, attorney actually followed me around and said, hey, man, you know, they don't know. And, and I could not hire him because I didn't have the money, Russell. Didn't have the money. And if you look at Arkansas's track record on these false convictions and things, just, you know, the West Memphis Three, you ever heard of that case? Three boys are, three boys will probably need to look it up. They spent 18, one spent 18 years on death row, the other two for life in prison for killing three other little boys and there was not a shred of evidence. They were convicted by public opinion. Okay? Not one shred of evidence. Guess what? They walked off death row, walked out of prison, and they're free now. So, you got to put everything in perspective. And yeah, the Dahmer thing did have something to do with it. It's a connection. It's a bunch of people who want to believe something that's not true. That's what it is. My son, I love him. That's unconditional love right there. You know, a son is something to have. That's my only son. And, you know, my only uh, child. So, you know, I've been kicked really hard. And screw the people who, who don't believe in me or whatever. But I'm a good guy. I'm a nice guy. You know, they may have threw me in the room with a, with this psycho psychopathic uh, sociopathic killer, but, you know, that was not my fault. I was 17 years old. Give me a break. Billy, I think it's fair to say that you are one of the only people that has ever survived knowing Jeffrey Dahmer. You're damn right. And you know, they, they need to listen to me just a little bit. And they need to listen to what Art Harris says. Art went through this case with a fine-tooth comb. I know that for a fact because I was there the whole time. There's no doubt in my mind no doubt in my mind that Jeff did this. Okay? I can tell from the anatomy stuff. I can tell from everything that, that he, of what he was and how he presented himself and all that kind of stuff. You know, it, it's Jeff, without a doubt. The people that are, are trying to push this down or whatever, they need to take a look at it. Let me tell you something. If I could go get my son Kip right now, you could cut my legs off, and I'll crawl with my bloody stumps to get him, and I would ride him back on my back, I promise you, if there was a doubt. There's no doubt in my mind that somebody needs to take a look at this thing again. The evidence is pretty clear. Some of it's pretty complicated. Some of it's not. They got a lot of stuff wrong, Russell.
a lot of stuff in this investigation is completely wrong. That is, it's the worst investigation, worse than the Memphis Three. I mean, it's, it's horrible that they would do something like that. It's crazy. Well, you say convicted on public opinion. Uh, was Tool not convicted on public opinion? I mean, have you, have you approached John Walsh with this information, Art? I've put my information out in the public, and I first tried to contact Mr. Walsh in 1997 when I did a story for a weekly called Broward New Times, and I couldn't get through to him. After that, going through his public relations people and stuff, I've not deliberately not tried to approach him myself when I've worked with for instance, the Miami Herald, um, ABC Primetime. I've had other reporters or producers I've worked with and have them approach John Walsh. So I don't know. I really don't know what John Walsh thinks, but I've certainly spoken to Hollywood police at great length. I've been friendly with them at some times and other times other than friendly. This is an independent investigation, and maybe they don't respect it because of that, but it's it's from information from their files and, and other files, and again, everything's documented. So they could go, they could speak to Billy Capshaw, and they could speak to, you no, know, the seven witnesses who were police witnesses to begin with, who came to the police, most of which, you know, came in the first couple of days after Adam was taken, but not all of them, and go and re-interview them, or just read what I wrote from them, and just, you know, ask Billy if what I wrote about Billy, and there's a, a, a chapter in my first book, Billy's Story, and ask him if that stuff is true or not. Billy, uh, for the audience who wants to learn more about you, there's the website survivingjeffreydahmer.com. You're also in a film. Can you talk about that briefly? Yeah, we uh, did a film over a period of a year. The name of it is Justice Tonight. It's about men raped in the military. You know, they had 26,000, I think, in 2012 in the United States. So, you know, it's pretty good. You know, yeah, I talk about uh, what happened a little bit, and there's some other people. People need to know this. I'm solid now, and it motivates me to help with things like the Adam Walsh story and the, the military uh, sexual trauma stuff. It just makes me stronger and stronger. you got to be able to give back. I've had some really good people helping me, you know, along the way to get better. I didn't do this by myself. People probably think I probably shouldn't be able to talk. There's a lot of people that think that. That's not the case. Very well, solid, very solid. I've been speaking to so many traumatized people recently for my story, and even people whose trauma was very, very brief. You don't get over it. You know, getting over it is, is hard. You don't forget it. And Billy is still surrounded by this every day. And all the pain, you know, the physical pain that he endures, just a reminder of Jeff Dahmer, Jeff Dahmer. I'm the first person who got the uh, autopsy report narratives of Jeff Dahmer's victims from Milwaukee County, the first person outside of you know, the institutions. And I showed them, I shared them with Billy and to see what could he discern from there, what could he tell me that hasn't been reported. Again, Billy was a paramedic as well in Arkansas, and Billy knows anatomy from Jeff. He saw that Jeff apparently kept his victims alive. They were being tortured. This was really horrendous stuff, and it's not been reported Documents are now public record, because I have them, and they just contradict. Now, Jeff said, I didn't like to see my victims go through pain. These people were alive when Jeff was cutting them up, and he kept them alive. It was, at the end, I wrote, rotten hell, Jeffrey Dahmer. Russell, he kept them alive. He enjoyed it. He enjoyed what he did to me. He kept them alive with a uh, thoracostomy tube, a breathing tube. He uh, severed the spine at certain areas, uh, many of his victims, so they couldn't get away or couldn't move or couldn't whatever, you know, and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's all crazy. I could see where one of them had a tracheostomy. 
you know, it's it's all crazy. And uh, there's another thing called a cricothyrotomy. I mean, you got all these things that he was doing, you know, and he knew that stuff better than anybody, probably as well as a as a physician, probably. I mean, he's just dissecting people while they're alive. People, you know, they don't get the sympathy for Jeff Dahmer should not be there. When he would beat me, and then he would rape me, or he would rape me and then beat me, it was confusing. I didn't know what to expect. I got tied to a bunk, given drugs, all that kind of crazy stuff. You know, he would get beside me, and, and he even told me he loved me one time. You know, I mean, stuff like that. And this guy was sick, okay? Somebody, and I think you know, know who I'm talking about, had trained this guy. He was not a regular guy, a regular 18, 19-year-old kid. He was not, okay? He had many years of training. For his age, I don't see how he had that much knowledge. But you asked or said to Billy, no, no, he's really the only survivor of Jeff Dahmer. And then I would propose that there is a second, a, a second prominent survivor of Jeff Dahmer. I relied on Billy to talk to this person, and I now it's getting getting late into this into the show, and um, I'd like to. Well, let uh, me ask you. Let me ask you this, Art: Is Adam Walsh dead? Adam Walsh, I believe, and I can't say this for certain because I don't have the forensic proof. But I have the anecdotal proof. Adam Walsh is not dead. I have been speaking to him for the last four years. Billy spoke to him at length. And Billy told me after speaking to him that he says, I can't tell you whether he's Adam Walsh or not. But his story of being taken from the mall by Jeff Dahmer, taken to a house of torture, as it turns out, in Miami Beach, Florida. Tell me, bottom line, is he telling the truth? Does he know Jeff Dahmer the way that you do? Yes, he does. He knew Jeff Dahmer, okay? Just like I did. For the audience who wants to learn more about uh, your story, Billy, there's a website. Uh, what's the web address for that? It's survivingjeffreydahmer.org. And uh, Art Harris, is there any websites that the audience can check for you? best thing is on your page there's links to my three books book one which we talk the most about there's book two which we just teased to yeah, the story is jeffrey dahmer's dirty secret the unsolved murder of adam walsh book one finding the killer was the man in the mall the most notorious murderer in history a true story book two is finding the victim the body identified as adam walsh is not him. Is Adam still alive? A true story. And I have a single edition, which is a briefer read of books one and two. First, the police found the body, then the killer. Neither was right. A true story. And I would certainly invite anyone to go to my Amazon or Barnes & Noble or Kobo or Apple well sites and go read some more that I've written there about the stories. And then, again, it may sound crazy. Oh, it certainly does sound crazy. This stuff is documented. One last question for both of you. If either of you were asked to testify in a court of law, would your testimony be the same then as it was today? Yes. Of course. Yes. Arthur J. Harris, Billy Capshaw, it's been uniquely... Wonderful to speak to both of you guys. Really enjoyed it. Uh, we'll do it again. Thank you both for being on the program. Hey, thank, thank you, you, Russell. Thank, thank you. you very much, Russell.